Good afternoon. If we could ask people to take their seats. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Jones. I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs here at BC and welcome to the Student Affairs Signature Speaker Series. This is the third speaker that we've had in the last year and a half who is a major speaker that we've brought to campus to address issues that are of concern and interest to a campus-wide audience around academic and student issues. And we're very happy to have you here this afternoon to enjoy our guest speaker. I'm going to turn it over now to Inez to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for being here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julianne Malvo. I had seen her before uh, in 2009 at ReConnect, and I heard her speak, and I thought, what a dynamic woman. I really want to get to know her. And so today, I had had the pleasure to spend a little bit of time with her. Um, so I'll read you her bio, which um, it's very interesting. So Dr. Malvo has been Long, has long been recognized for her progressive and insightful observations. She's a labor economics, noted author, and colorful commentator. She's a strong advocate of social issues, which is reflected in her teaching, writing, and leadership. At lunchtime, she referred to her as a person who had a series of adventures. And her adventures include writing columns for newspapers across the country, hosting television and radio programs, and commenting on networks such as CNN, BET, PBS, and others. Dr. Julianne Malvo has been a contributor to academic life since receiving her PhD in economics from MIT in 1980. She has been on the faculty or visiting faculty of the New School for Social Research, San Francisco State University, the University of California, Berkeley, Michigan State University and Howard University. She received her bachelor's and master's degree in economics at the best college in Chestnut Hill. And I, don't, I guess you won't know which one it is. During her time at, as the 15th president of Bennett College for Women, Dr. Julianne Malveaux was the architect of exciting and innovative transformation at America oldest historically black college for women. Under her leadership, Bennett College successfully received a 10-year reaffirmation of his accreditation from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, markedly improved existing facilities, embarked on a 21 million capital improvements program, and in the fall of 2009, enjoy a historic enrollment high. Currently, Dr. Malvo serves on the boards of the Economic Policy Institute, as well as the Recreation Wish Committee of Washington, D.C. A native San Franciscan, she's the president and owner of Economic Education, a 501c3 nonprofit focused on personal finance and economic policy education and their connection. It is a treat to listen to Dr. Malvo. We had a chance to listen to her at lunchtime today. She's a dynamic speaker. Please join me in welcoming Julianne back home. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a delight and a pleasure to be here. It is back home for me. Boston College did an awful lot for me. I don't know if anybody remembers, probably Howard does. Um, Father, uh, was it Dr. Lawton, Howard? Dr. Lawton, hmm? who um, had us do speech and communications, uh, debate. Now, the funny thing I was telling one of the students at lunch, we had to pull a number in order to, to do radio. And we were all given an assignment from midnight to 5 a.m. at one of the local radio stations. Unfortunately, this was also the evening that I was supposed to cross the burning sands, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So I said to Father Lott, can I get a break? And he said, no. So 
you know, I had to cross. And so, you know, this was a dilemma. But I talked to the radio host and whined, and he said, okay, I'll let you get off at three. So when I went out to Brandeis, where we were crossing, they made me eat everything that everybody else was eating, but all at one time. So you know I was sick. And then I told them, do not put your hands on me, because one of the rituals was to be paddled. And homie, don't play that. So <laughs> when the lady had to paddle, I grabbed it from her and said, how do you think this is gonna go down? <laughs> so she um, essentially passed. But I think about Father Lawton all the time, Dr. Lawton all the time, when I'm speaking. Because really, he did teach us debate. Dr. Harold Peterson is here. He was the chair of the econ department while I was here. He was a strict and strong taskmaster. But again, my experience at MIT had the seeds of what Dr. Peterson shared with me. So I'm very grateful. I was grateful for the BC experience. Um, I came, people say, how do you get from California to BC? Well, I was raised Catholic, and I skipped, no, I was not a high school dropout, I was a high school put out. So I skipped the 11th grade, or the 11th grade skipped me, and my mom said, you have to go someplace where they have priests. So that was BC, <laughs> Jesuits. But if anybody, Howard, I think Abdul Note Logan was here. Those priests were the same priests as the ones we knew. As a freshman, I actually, my first time getting drunk was with the Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> they had all this booze, and they said, well, and I kept saying, this doesn't make sense. They started out with something, aperitif. They ended up with sherry. In the middle, there was a lot of wine. And I had to walk back to my dorm. And I'm like, I don't think this is going to turn out right. But um, again, it was a very rich experience. Uh, some students have asked about the black, um, well, we had a black talent program. And actually, we ran it. Students ran it. Uh, we admitted people. We uh, expelled people. Uh, we did any number of things with black talent. But we also had a black student forum, just like many students have today. And um, in many ways, we ran that as well. There is a gentleman named A. Robert Phillips who empowered us to do the work that we needed to do and helped us learn how to organize. And so when I talk to people about my experiences, I talk to them about BC. It's very interesting. I have never given a quarter to MIT. It's not that I'm mad at MIT, well, but I've never given a quarter to MIT. But when I write checks, I write them to Boston College because that was the richness of the experience that allowed me to go to MIT. Now, one of these days, I'll probably write them a check if they have some kind of endowment for a professor that I liked. But um, back in the ranch, you know, and Harold, you ought to have an endowment in your name for an econ student. I promise you the first grand. Um, no, seriously, we have to lift up the people who lifted us up. And so it would be my pleasure and delight to do that. Now, oops, excuse me, I'm dripping. Why are we here? We're here to talk about economics and race. Could somebody bring me a Kleenex or something? I don't know why. I have one in my purse. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, why, we're here to talk about economics and race, but we might want to step back and just talk about economics. What is economics? Economics is the study of who gets what, when, where, and why. It's a study about how you slice the pie up. Who gets what, when, where, and why. And when we talk about how people are paid, we're looking at factors of production. Those of you who've done Econ 101 have heard this before. And the factors of pr production are land, labor, I forgot the middle one, but entrepreneurial ability. Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability. So land gets rent, labor gets wages, capital gets rent, and entrepreneurial ability gets profits. Now, how do we put this in a racial context? And most of the African-American, this has changed a bit, 
many of the African-American economists that I know focus on labor. And why did they focus on labor? Because you had a two to one ratio between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans are twice as likely, twice as likely to be unemployed. And then if you look more deeply at the underemployment numbers, unemployment rate is 5.8%. But if you look at utilization, the overall unemployment rate is about 11%. That means when you're looking at African-Americans, the unemployment rate is 11.2. When you look at the same ratio for African-Americans and overall, you get a number that looks like something like 22, 23%. So when people talk about economic recovery, it really hasn't trickled down. Not only has it not trickled down for African Americans, but honestly, it hasn't trickled down for many people. We have economic growth at about 3.5%, but who gets the 3.5? We have people whose wages have been stagnant. They have not risen. Um, in the past seven or eight years. You have people who essentially, when their wages haven't risen, they basically are falling back. We have a labor market that is fraying. In other words, you are getting the same wage, but many employers are saying, you have to pay a higher copay with your health insurance. You have to, have to pay a higher uh, amount for your health insurance. This is eroding your wages. And this is why people are not jumping up and down when we hear about economic growth. We see some people saying this is exciting, but other people are saying not really. And so when we saw in 2008, the bailouts for banks, $797 billion for banks, what was the thought? The thought was that banks would lend money. They got this big amount of money and the thought was that they lend it. Instead, they tightened credit requirements so you used to be able to get a home loan for a credit score of about 680. Now it's 720. So it's tightening essentially the requirements. The banks have been subsidized through the federal government. Has your student loan been subsidized? So you're paying between 3.4 and 6.8% on your student loan. But the interest rate that the Fed has artificially kept down is one, 1.5 percent. Actually, probably a little less than that. So essentially, that inflation down helps banks, but if you're old, it doesn't help you. If you're getting a pension, it doesn't help you. Your um, pension costs, your pension will not go up, but um, other costs will. And so again, what we see is people who are saying, this is not working for me. Now. When we talk about land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability, understand that people of African descent in this country were other people's factors of production. In other words, they were able to accumulate because we were property. Now, I'm not saying that there have been intergenerational transfers. Most of your grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents were not slave owners, however, you benefited from a system that was exploiting, that was exploiting. And you benefited from essentially an environment that allowed discrimination. Some of our unions would not let African Americans in the unions. Now this really caused African Americans to be what Marxist economists call the reserve army of the unemployed. So if you look at Chicago, for example, where you had major industrialization, at the beginning of the century, how were unions busted? They brought black folks and said they were not in the union. So they brought black folks and said, we'll pay these black people less than we pay you because they weren't unionized. Imagine that those folks had gotten together. What kind of wages might they have had? So race has been used to divide the working class, but race has also in so many ways been used to create a certain kind of environment. So the challenge is to look at what kind of discrimination comes out of the environment that has been created. And we know that even today, there are ways that racism is used to essentially deal with an environment. I'll tell you a funny story, which is not really funny. I went to a corporate um, 
think I spent an hour with this corporation. They had a um, diversity day, and they had me on some um, Skype or something to talk to their 35,000 employees on diversity. Well, number one, they cut me off. I guess I did not follow the script. So at some point, the young man who was my host got a note, and they said, uh, one more question. Now, the, um, it was billed as an hour and a half. I think I got 45 minutes. One more question. But more importantly, this young man told me that a noose was left on somebody's desk, a noose. And then the supervisor said it was a joke. Nooses are not jokes. So you created an environment where somebody thinks it's okay to put a noose on somebody's desk. What does that mean? It means it's a hostile work environment. It means I'm not sure that you want to work there. It means that racism has created a space that makes it okay. This becomes one of the challenges when we look at race and the economy. Some of this stuff is written down, some of it is law, but lots of it is just unspoken. And when it's unspoken, what we end up is income and unemployment differentials. When you look at every single, every single indicator of economic well-being, what do you find? Unemployment, as I said, two to one. Income, median income for whites is about $52,000. For African Americans, about $35,000. It used to be two to one, but it's, it's narrowed, but still, 55, 35. If you look at um, education, you see that about 35% of whites have finished uh, college, 35% of whites between 30, uh, 25 and 34. Meanwhile, only 18% of African Americans, again, that two to one, have finished college. And it's very interesting, if you put this contextually, our whole country is going to hell in a handbasket. We look at education. In um, 1978, 88, um, the number of people in our country who um, had a BA or AA degree represented 40% of our nation, 40%. By 2008, the number of people in our country represented 40%. What does that mean? It means we have not progressed, or we have not figured out how to provide teaching technology for whom? School children, school college graduates have become increasingly black and brown. We don't know how to educate black and brown young people. Some of you professors will say, well, we educate them the same way that we educate anybody else. Not. Different young people have different learning styles. Some walk around to learn. Others um, need to hear, sit and hear. Some need to talk. Now, some professors will say, I don't think so. But you do. Harold, about five years ago, I was on campus, and the person will remain unnamed, but there was a colleague of yours who had the same syllabus that he had in 1974. Now, it wasn't exactly the same. There was a little bit that had changed, but I like Labor law had changed. Uh-oh, I gave it up. Uh, laws had changed, and you're still sitting there using the same syllabus. Another thing that faculties have done is refuse to move forward with technology. This generation, you know, it's like this. I've seen people across the room from each other texting. And you say, why don't you just walk across the room? But that's communication. I'm not suggesting that you teach with Twitter, but I am suggesting that there are ways to incorporate technology into teaching. Unless we do things like that, we're going to end up with quite a flat, quite a flat um, number of people in college. Now, somebody might say, well, everybody doesn't need to go to college. And that's kind of true. But we've eliminated training in the trades. So we want 
training in the trades. We want young people to be carpenters and electricians. Have you ever tried to find an electrician lately? Or a carpenter? It's very difficult. But, you know, it's very much a, something that we want to deal with. So we don't necessarily have to go to college, but we have to, at some level, have some training. And that doesn't often happen. Because we don't have this kind of training, we end up with a poverty that is crippling. The poverty level for African Americans is about 27%. This is an economic recovery. The poverty level for Latinos is 26% in economic recovery. Overall, the poverty level is about 14%, and the po poverty level for whites is 10.8%. So we're looking at real differentials in poverty that, again, are the function of what? These poverty rates are a function of less unemployment, or less employment, less income, less education, and so we deal with that. Now, I don't want to quote Lauren Hill when I'm talking about economics, but Lauren Hill said one time, it's not what you cop, it's what you keep. And what that means is income is what you cop. Wealth is what you keep. When we look at wealth, what we see are even more differentials, and wealth represents the things that you're able to have access to. Wealth represents the way that you might pay your child's college tuition. Wealth represents the ways that you might pay for major illness. Did you know that the primary reason for bankruptcy is hospital bills? So re wealth represents that. Wealth represents, and this is a horrible example, but it's important, wealth represents the fact that you can bail somebody out of jail or not. You have the dollars. I don't know how many young African-American men have had to stay in jail for six, seven, eight months because no one had the money to bail them out. And so when you look at some of these things, you ask questions about wealth. Now, median wealth for African-Americans is something under $10,000 a year. The number really is something like six, seven thousand dollars. The number for whites is about thirty thousand dollars. Now that was median. If you look at mean, both of them are higher, but African Americans tend to have something that looks like twenty-six thousand dollars, while whites tend to have something that looks like a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. When you break it out, and I think people may have seen the statistic uh, last year, an African American woman between 25 and 45 has a median wealth of $5. That's a Coca-Cola. That is one Coca-Cola. And why does that happen? Because people are helping people in their families, because these women are not making enough money. And so when we look at that, we have to ask, what are we doing to suppress wealth, and what might we do to expand wealth? This becomes the, one of the ways that we look at inequality. And, you know, uh, Alice Rivlin, Alice Rivlin, I wanted her to be the head of the Fed. Janet Yellen, who was the head of the Federal Reserve, first woman, um, gave a speech about two weeks ago where she talked about inequality. Now, the Fed doesn't usually talk about inequality. The Fed usually talks about money, monetary policy. But why did she talk about inequality? Because inequality has an impact on the quality of the economy. Because the more people that are unemployed, the less money that gets spent. 75% of our GDP is what? Consumer spending. So if people are not spending money, you're not expanding the economy. So this becomes an issue. And be, it becomes an issue around race because, again, you have people who are earning less. You have people who are not participating in the labor market. You have people who are at the periphery. So, we look at a couple things. Let's look at credit. Now, let me roll back. About 8% of African Americans, excuse my Ebonics, ain't got no stuff. They, they have no savings. They have no automobiles. They have no hope. They have nothing. They show up in the wealth data as having nothing. About 1% of whites are in the same position. So you have people who simply don't have anything. When you look at home ownership, which is the way that people move into the middle class, 
46% of African Americans own their homes compared to roughly 70% of whites. And so these, basically this income expanding opportunity is denied African Americans. Now why? Again, somebody could say there's no racism. Well, in the mortgage market, there's something called the thin file and the thick file. Anybody heard about the thin file and the thick, thick file? The thin file is where you go, basically fill out an application to get a mortgage, and they put it in an envelope, and they say, you're not qualified. Um, they look at the numbers, they look at your credit score, and they say, you're not qualified. The thick file is when the banker works with you. And they say, maybe somebody could put $10,000 in your account to help you out. Maybe you need to get a part-time job so that your income looks better. These are suggestions that are not given to anyone, everyone. Again, is it racist? Not really. Is it a function of perception? Absolutely. Is anybody policing this? No. Or looking at this? No. And so we have a challenge. We have an issue. We have a way that people are peripheralized. Now, mortgages. A third of the African Americans who have mortgages qualify for regular loans, but they have subprime loans. So the interest rates are higher. Uh, the opportunities for exploitation are higher. Who is being exploited? African American elderly. My mom called me one day and she said this guy, her steps are a little dilapidated, well we fixed them. She said this guy said he could fix my steps for $5,000. I said okay. She said but I have to take out a $50,000 loan. I said excuse me? She said because 5,000 is too small of an amount for them to write a loan. I said, mother, have you lost your mind? She said, well, I know you're an economist and everything, but think about it. And I said, I'll be home. I said, I'm getting, on the, I'm getting on the next plane, and I intend to take care of this man, and he's not gonna like it. And she said, Julian, don't get pugilistic. And I said, this man is trying to rip you off. But many of our elders have gotten into deals like that for things like meat. People say, I'll fill your refrigerator or your freezer with meat. And then they charge you more than you need it. So we have to look at some of these things and these predatory practices. Who are more likely to be victims of these practices? Again, African American people. So what we have to know is that we need consumer protection and we need to have conversations with our elderly about what makes sense. And quite frankly, more of us need to be connected to our elderly. And many of us are not. So we look at all of these issues in terms of your income, um, in terms of, see, we're talking about income, we're talking about education, we're talking about wealth, we're talking about employment. Now, I don't want to assume that every African American is going to jail. But here's what I know. 50% of those people who are incarcerated are African Americans. Now some of them did something and some of them didn't. The ratio of African Americans who go to jail for marijuana to whites is eight to one. People smoke the same amount of marijuana, but the police are more likely to pick up an African American than to pick up a white. What does this have to do with the economy? I talked to you a few minutes ago about wealth. If you can't bail yourself out, they will just hold you in jail until your number comes up. People are in jail for seven, eight, nine months for two joints. This makes no sense. There is enormous discretion in the criminal justice system, especially for people who commit small offenses but that discretion does not always work in favor of African Americans. I just met someone in Baltimore who's attempting to do a study to look at one judge in Baltimore to find out if there are different practices in sentencing African Americans or whites, different practices. The other thing we know when we talk about income is the whole story about credit. 
under Bill Clinton and certainly under Mr. Bush, a law was passed that said that tightened credit requirements. So it said you must pay your credit cards before you pay anything else. Credit cards are prioritized over child support. So gentlemen who owe child support have to first pay their credit cards. 46% of African Americans, about 35% of whites, have credit card debt. This again becomes an issue. And when whites have mortgage equity, they're more likely to tap that equity that African Americans are able to. What am I doing here? I'm showing you a set of patterns that have a series of issues. I'm suggesting that we look at those patterns and I'm suggesting that while we look at economic expansion, we ask the question of who benefits from economic expansion. And when you ask that question, you might get excited about the Occupy movement. My problem with Occupy, they were amazing, but they had no goals. So they just showed up on Wall Street, showed up somewhere, blocked traffic, but they had no goals. They were somewhat effective in that they blocked traffic. But after you block traffic, what do you want? And you have to basically have some goals. But the Occupy movement made the point, which was important, that the 99% are left out. Now, I think their number was high. It might have been 80%, but the majority of people were left out. Who else was left out? People who did not hold stock. People who did not hold stock were pretty much left out as the stock market began to rise. What we know, again, is that African Americans are less likely to hold stock than whites are. So again, there's a wealth-creating opportunity that African Americans did not have the possibility of. So again, when you look at these opportunities, you have to say, this is why we have an economic gap. This is what's going on. If we talk about the Great Recession and recovery, interesting data, Asians recovered at the level of about 96%. So whatever Asians lost, they got it back. They got 96% of it back. Whites got about 80% of theirs back. African Americans and Latinos got about 55% of theirs back. Again, what's the difference? What the wealth holdings they had, what kind of income they had, and whether or not they were laid off. At the height of the Great Recession, we had unemployment, long-term unemployment, that got to 36%. No, average of 36 weeks, which meant you're unemployed about as long as it would take you to gestate a baby. 36 weeks of unemployment. What do you think people do in 36 weeks of unemployment, especially if they have no savings? They wind down. So the corporate CEO is now working at Subway. And while, you know, I'm not mad at him, but he has essentially taken a hit. When you look at some of these stories, you're looking at ego loss, you're looking at family repercussions, you're looking at the loss of productivity. But there are opportunities to generate jobs. The Obama Recovery Act created money for states. South Carolina sent their money back. They said, we don't want the money. Very conservative. They sent their money back, which could have employed thousands, tens of thousands of people in South Carolina. Nikki Haley said that she did not believe in federal subsidies. Bobby Jindal in Louisiana did the same thing. He sent the money back. Have you ever heard of such foolishness? Well, they sent the money back while people in their states were unemployed. And so President Obama attempted to do economic expansion, but many of the people, many of the states who got it, didn't want it. In addition, President Obama has attempted to implement a progressive agenda. Now, I say attempted because he's faced opposition in Congress and in the Senate. Last year, this Congress attempted to cut food stamps. 
and in fact, they did. Food stamps represent what the corporate CEO, when he makes $10 an hour, is getting. And we can't judge. I had a comeuppance um, not too long ago. There was a woman in my neighborhood with a Benz, and she was standing outside one of the um, food, food banks. And I looked at her and rolled my eyes and said, why is this woman with a Benz sitting outside food bank? And I thought about it, and I, those of you who know me know I'm pugilistic. Um, I have a habit of confronting people when it's none of my business. And I said, ma'am, you have a Benz. Why are you standing in the food line? And she said, because my husband and I have not worked in six months. She said, I have the Benz because we had it before. She said, don't judge me because I have a nice car. I can't sell this car. It has 90,000 miles on it. So I got, you know, my comeuppance. I learned a lesson. Again, you know, don't judge. But you've got people who are at the food banks because the food stamps are not there. We talk about people who have more month than money. And basically, their money runs out between the 25th and the 27th of the month. And then what do they do? They go to the food banks. They stretch it as much as they can. They have ketchup sandwiches. This is where we are in supposedly one of the richest countries in the world. President Obama, again, has attempted to have a progressive agenda, but too many people have pushed back and said they don't want a progressive agenda. When we look at the minimum wage, an economist will argue about the minimum wage, but we know that $7, I forget what it is, um, and 35 cents is not a living wage. We know that a woman and two children has a, has a minimum, a poverty is lower than $15,000 for a woman and two children. We have people called the extremely extreme poor. They have an income of $7,000, half of what the uh, poverty rate is, $7,000 in income. Now just think about it, $7,000. $7,000. What can you buy with $7,000? Yet you have these big, big box stores, and I'll try my best not to mention them, uh, but they begin with W and MB. But these big box stores that assiduously work not to give people benefits. So I'm on a committee called uh, Justice for Walmart Workers. Okay, I told it. Um, <laughs> But it's called Justice for Walmart Workers, and essentially the um, Food and Commercial Union is doing some things about this. We have conference calls periodically, and I was one call on one call where they had a couple. The couple talked about their work at Walmart. She was a floor supervisor making essentially $9 an hour, but she was working 22 hours a week. Why? 30 hours requires you to pay health care. Her husband was a, he worked in the warehouse. He got between 22 and 25 hours a week at about $8 an hour, which meant neither of them had health care. They had three children, and they were on the call, and they talked about their circumstances. And of course, everybody was sympathetic, but it was interesting. The woman had one of those southern twangs, you know, big twangs, so you didn't know if she was African American or white. All you knew is that she was twanging. And what she said at the end of the call is, by the way, I'm white. So she wanted to make it clear that these problems are not just African American problems. But African Americans, 12% of the population, 36% of those who live in this situation. People talk about the minimum wage and say it's for kids, but two-thirds of the people who earn the minimum wage are women. Half of that group are grown women. These are not children who are 18 and 19 years old working for pen money. These are women who are trying to support their families. So the pushback on the minimum wage 
does not make any sense. The pushback, of course, people will say, well, people are going to lay people off, and this isn't right. People will lay some people off, but they'll also expand when they need to. We have not, again, been able to have the kind of progressive agenda that allows the Congress to deal with minimum wage. We have not had a progressive agenda that allows the Congress to deal with health care. In fact, the Republican route is likely to reduce or eliminate President Obama's Affordable Care Act. Now, I don't know if people saw the Bill Maher piece where Bill Maher asked people, how do you feel about Obamacare? And people said, I don't like it. Then they said, how do you feel about the Affordable Care Act? Oh, I love it. But they're the same thing. So people have attempted to demonize our president, and too many people have not come back and said, this is ridiculous. And so we look at, which I think that uh, President Obama's health care is his signature achievement. But that signature achievement is being eroded by folks who think it's socialism. When we look at the bottom of the labor market, it's really important when we look at people who earn the minimum wage to look at what they do. They take care of our children. They take care of our mothers. At the bottom of the minimum wage, these are people who we entrust in the people that we love. Now, if you make $8 an hour and you work in an old folks home, what are you going to be? Mad. And I don't want mad people moving my mother from the bedpan to the bed. I don't want anybody dropping my mama because they're mad because they only make $8 an hour. Now, I'm not going to say they're all mad. But earning $8 an hour is a frustrating experience, especially when you have children and when you're, try when you're trying to make in me ends meet. Even more importantly, there are people who are working under the table, earning little or nothing, Usually they're Latinos, occasionally they're African Americans, usually they're Latinos who are threatened by the fact that they don't have a green card. So people will say, I'm going to report you, and in some cases, they're earning little or nothing. During Hurricane Katrina, I had the opportunity to cover some of the labor market issues in Hurricane Katrina. Here's what we know. Um, the um, contractor was getting paid $60 an hour to employ. Now, they had a little overhead, but $60 an hour. The union workers were getting $35 an hour. So they're making $25 an hour on the union workers. The non-unionized, who were legal, basically African Americans, were making roughly $25 an hour. The Latinos who were working, or the ununionized, were making about $10 an hour. There were no benefits. And so in one site, in Moss Point, Mississippi, which happens to be where my family is from, but in one site where they were building, a Latino brother fell off the roof, and he was impaled by a pitchfork. They took him, he lay there for a couple of hours, and then they took him to the hospital and dumped him out because there was no health insurance. This is the di differential that we experience time after time. This is the differential that we have to deal with if we talk about justice in the future. The demographics are going to change in ways that will for force us to look at justice in the future. By 2030 or 2040, half of America will be black and brown. People of color will dominate. Now it's interesting, I saw a piece where um, the writer said, if people of color dominate, we're not going to have enough workers. So they were encouraging immigration for people, for countries, industrialized countries. They said parts of Europe were going to have shortages, part of the United States was going to have shortages. And my thought was, why not go to the hood? You're not going to have that many shortages. You have young people in Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco and parts of San Jose. You have people in Harlem. You have people in East LA who could be trained. But instead, people are talking about importing people who have skills. 
Now, I'm not hating on people who have skills, but I'm saying that there are opportunities for Americans to work. The demographic shift is going to force us to look underutilized populations, is going to force us to say, what are we planning to do? It's going to force us to look at who is taking care of our mothers, our fathers, our children. And it's going to force us to say, we're going to have to raise some of these wages. Garbage workers, by and large, are unionized. Not all, but many. But let's remember the struggle that Dr. King had in Memphis, Tennessee. You had men who were walking around with signs that said, I am a man. And why did they have those signs? Because they were not treated as men. They experienced wage differentials in 1968 that were major, $1.65, $1.65 for whites, 95 cents an hour for African Americans. Not only that, but when white men were injured on the job, there was compensation. When black men were, there was none. In addition, when it rained, white men were giving inside jobs. African Americans were told, just go home. Those kind of inequalities have disappeared mostly in contemporary times, but you can still find racial differentials. And so well, what do we begin to do about this? And that's really what we have to talk about. What do we do about it? Because we can talk until we're blue in the face about what's going on, what's wrong, but what's right. We have the opportunity in 2014 to build a progressive movement. We have the opportunity to politically push back. I don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. You can't be satisfied with the number of poor people that we have in our society. Dr. King once said, um, there are 40 million, and the number has changed, poor people in America. And why do we have 40 million poor people? Who owns the oil? Who owns the iron ore? If the world is two-thirds water, why do we pay water bills? Don't try that with the water company. But understand that what he was saying is this is a distribution issue. In another one of his quotes, he talked about the value of society and poverty. He talked about poverty being an abomination in our age. He said that it was as evil as cannibalism at the turn of the world as evil as cannibalism. And so we have a challenge to look at our sisters and brothers, and by and large they're African American, or disproportionately they're African American, but they're many whites. But we look at this issue and we begin to say, what are we going to do about it? Do we have the collective will to do anything? Are we simply okay with that many people being poor? This is a Jesuit institution. The Council of Catholic Bishops has talked about economic justice. Now, they haven't done anything. They do uh, issue wonderful reports, um, but they haven't done anything. But because this is a Catholic institution, I would suggest that people look at these reports and figure out what they can do. We have a situation where we're looking at people being peripheralized. We're looking at the, a need still for affirmative action, because that's one way to get more people into the labor market. Um, like James Brown said, I got all my hip hop folks, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door and I'll get it myself. Affirmative action is opening the door and then you've got to hang. Too many people have had doors slammed in their face. And why is this? Because power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Those who want freedom without agitation are those who want the ocean without its mighty roar. Our economy isn't right, it isn't fair. It's difficult to talk about economic change, but guess what? It's possible if you look at ways that poverty and other factors have warped our society. And we need to talk about it. Gloria Steinem once said, if you have a problem and you keep it to yourself, it's a personal problem. 
If you tell the story about your problem and others say, I have that problem too, it's a political problem. Racism and poverty are political problems. We need to work on fixing them. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? I believe we have some time for questions, if there are questions. Y'all don't have any questions? Over there. Um, can you speak to issues with um, employees and not getting proper wages? My question is specifically regarding Walmart. What are the best ways to go about helping to implement change besides just boycotting the company because in the end boycotting the company could negatively impact the employees you're attempting to help? I think that people, the unions who are or organizing around Walmart probably need your help. I think that conversations with their leaders are important. One of the things that we did in Washington, they proposed six stores. A measure was passed that said big box stores had to pay $12.50 an hour. They declined doing six stores and they ended up doing three. Now some people said this was a reduction in the number of jobs that we had in DC which has very high levels of unemployment. At the same time, many of the people who would have been employed said I don't want to work for $8 an hour. That's not enough money. So that kind of intervention, and it was very hot in the city council because um, uh, you know, there was a back and forth. But people need to say these are not working conditions. One of the other things, you have a disproportionate number of women who are working in these stores. Some of these people do not have paid sick leave. So you have the choice of going to work sick and infecting everybody else or of essentially um, staying home and not getting paid. There are a whole bunch of things that women are not able to get in the labor market, especially when they're single women who are living in poverty jobs. And this is another organizing issue. Mm -hmm. Sir? Uh, professor Charles Smith, Boston College's first African American tenure professor. The question that, an observation and then a question. An observation that I have made personally is that American racism is not like racism in other parts of the world. And I say that from having been on all six continents, South, South Pole I have been on. But the other, racism down the street to Mas of Moscow is not like walking down the streets of South Boston. I'm just, just an observation. My concern or question is, we do a admirable job, a, a, a good job, of educating our students academically here. But I feel we don't do anything to prepare them to deal with racism once they graduate. And I think that's, a, that, that's criminal. We, we, the academics, we do very well. But when they get that degree and go out there to try to get a job, or when they get the job, what they live with, we don't do it. It seems to me that needs to be included in our curriculum. You know, when colleges and universities have attempted to include those kind of things in the curriculum, they've got an enormous backlash. When um, some colleges have attempted to require one African American studies class in, inside the whole curriculum. There has been backlash. One of the first things I did at Bennett College was had a diversity forum. Now everybody said, this woman is crazy. This is a historically black college and university. Why would you have a diversity forum? We had white folks on the faculty. We had Asian folks on the faculty. We had GBLT people who did not feel that they were recognized. We had a whole, African Americans are not homogenous. There are a number of people that are coming from different places. 
I had a faculty member tell me once, I thought it was hilarious, just because you light skin, you can't say anything to me. I said, well, you know, when would you like to get your hat? Because, um, and of course, you can't fire somebody with tenure for something like that, but I kind of made it clear. I did reduce the woman's budget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we still have skin color discrimination in the African-American community. So the whole diversity issue is one that African-Americans have to deal with. Our whole society has to deal with. But when you look at curriculum, I think it's very difficult to force colleges and universities who see their curriculum as full. You know, we have the 40 classes and we don't have room for any more. So your first tenured professor, that's your job. Seriously. Another question? Ma'am? Reject that, okay, um, what was said was a lot of people think uh, the problem is internal, internal, just internalized inferiority um, complexes, I guess, that many African Americans have, and what do we do about it? See, I kind of reject that notion. I think that the issue, and if you do have an, in, in, give me a job. If I have internalized racism, give me a job or inferiority. Just give me a job. I think that there are possibilities with African Americans and women where there is a timidity um, about asking for what you need or want because you're afraid that you aren't going to get it. Such as the people who had the subprime mortgages and didn't push to get others. But I'll tell you what um, a friend told me about men and women with MBAs. She said when, men are, when women are offered a job, six figures, they say, oh, I'm going to Disneyland. When men are offered a job, six figures, they say, is that all? The most powerful words in the negotiating table, in my opinion, is that all. Now, you might get more and you might not, but you've got to push and ask, is that all? And so I do think that people are not emboldened, but I don't think it's necessarily internalized inferiority. I think it's observations of what happens in the labor market. Y'all have been a really wonderful audience. Again, I want to thank you for your questions and your comments and the opportunity to come home to Boston College. Thank you. Thank you.